Today, I'll be going over seven points about Hell's Kitchen that will shock, disgust, or even traumatize you if you ask nicely. Seriously though, make sure to stick around till the end, because I bet you're gonna get blindsided by at least one or two of these. Okay, how about we start with a rather controversial take about the man himself, Gordon Ramsay. Number one, Gordon Ramsay is more a fan of men than women. Okay, now before you get all weirded out and start attacking me, let me tell you, I'm not the one making this accusation. I'm quoting former Hell's Kitchen season five contestant, Carol Scott. So take it up with her if you're mad. In 2009, Mark from Reality Wanted asked Carol if she got to make friends with Ramsey. To which Carol responded that Ramsey was mainly present for services and challenges, appearing to be strictly focused on work. That we get, right? It's expected. Now here comes the interesting part. The interviewer then pointed out how Ramsey seemed to hang out more with the guys, and Carol agreed. In her own words, when it comes to work, I think Gordon is more a fan of men than women. I don't mean this in a nasty way, but I think he feels the position is better suited for men, even though he does have some amazing women working for him. Remember that this interview happened in 2009, and a lot has changed since then. For example, now you have Chef Christina Wilson as Ramsey's ride or die right hand woman. Still though, back in the day, some of her castmates agreed with her sentiment. Let's look at one example. Colleen, also from season five, was asked if they got to spend any quality time with Ramsey. And here's what she revealed. No, he didn't spend any real time with the ladies. Even when we won challenges, he didn't really hang out with us like he did with the guys. So is Chef Ramsay a man's man? Well, again, that's not me. That's what the interviewer asked. And guess what Colleen said? He is. One interesting thing to note here is that season five was filmed in November of 2008. The same notorious year, Ramsey's personal life, his image as a loving family man, was shattered by some pretty serious cheating allegations. There was also the potential for serious business disruptions as his father-in-law Chris Hutchinson was the CEO of his company and a major investor. At the time, he predicted Ramsey's restaurants, pubs, TV shows, and other earnings would bring in $238 million a year in revenue within two years. So you can see the incentive to jump in financially. Back to the matter at hand though, in 2008, a woman named Sarah Simmons made headlines by alleging that she had a secret relationship with Ramsey for seven years. According to Simmons, the sneaky link started after their meeting at China White Nightclub in 2001. Simmons gained attention for her insights into cheating behavior, even hosting her own reality TV show called The Mistress in 2012, where she assisted mistresses in ending relationships with married men. The self-proclaimed professional mistress wrote in her book that Ramsey confided in her friend about his marital issues, saying he was was relegated to sleeping in the basement. Simmons also alleged, I still can't understand why Gordon, who claims to be happily married, was at a nightclub at 2 a.m. She recounted that during one of their supposed 18 encounters, she was introduced to Tana by Ramsey at the launch of his Kananat Hotel restaurant in October 2002. I felt very awkward. At one point in the evening, I called Gordon Big Boy because he is very well endowed, and he told me to keep my voice down. And what was Ramsey's response, you ask? Well, it was true and characteristic to his unfiltered style. In fact, British media reported Ramsey denying the allegations during a cooking demonstration, saying, come on though, if I was really going to cheat, wouldn't it be with a complete slapper? Interestingly, he never took legal action against Sarah regarding the accusations, and it's widely reported that he apologized to his wife, who was embarrassed by the claims. Well, leaving all that dirt in the past, because I am not qualified to dig it up. Time for number two. Most winners of Hell's Kitchen are robbed of their promised prize. Yep, it happened with so many of them. But you should already be well aware of that if you watch my video on it here. It was so scandalous that Dan from season 11 said, it's almost better to be the runner up than win. More freedom. 
He further elaborated, they get a job as head chef, kind of a made-up position, at the restaurant with a $250,000 salary. They work, sometimes as an overpaid line cook, sometimes as more. The money is broken up into 52 paychecks, taxed as prize money. So it's a substantially higher tax rate. They also do a lot of PR work. If they quit, the money stops. Most don't renew their contract afterwards. Lower pay, possibly different position. They can choose to not take the job, get a $150 lump sum payment, taxed as prize money, but still do a ton of PR work to make it look like they work there. Either way, you are property of Fox Television and ITV for that year. Even a contestant who didn't win, myself, has to ask permission to do any public events as a chef from Hell's Kitchen for one year from the date of airing of the finale episode. Yeah. So what do you have to say? Get in the comments and vent out. Meanwhile, I'm off to number three, everyone's favorite topic. Turns out many viewers have accused Hell's Kitchen of platforming sexism. Like, imagine saying something like this today. And then there were all the contestants like Jason Underwood, Frank Kala, and the entire cast of season 16. How fun is it to rip these red lobsters in half? It's extremely fun. Oh, come on. They kept splitting up the teams over and over. It's tiring in my book. In fact, shout out to one of my viewers who left a comment agreeing that the divide by sexes is getting old. And maybe the sous chefs could draft their own teams after the signature dish challenge. Really impressive comment. And I'll be the first on the picket line so you get a fat royalty check when that suggestion gets implemented. Seriously though, the entire men versus women thing feels like a cheap way to create conflict for television. They've been doing this since season two, and honestly, it gives a lot of free passes to say unwarranted things. Tramp. <laughs> Don't even get me started on some of the stuff the guys on the blue team say. It's just plain gross. Like when they lose a challenge and have to do cleaning or laundry, they start going on and on about how that's women's work and the guy shouldn't have to clean. Be where they should be at. Cheers. <laughs> Seriously, it's 2024, not 1924. And the way they sexualize and degrade women, sometimes even customers, crosses the line more times than not. Fuck my hot plate. Yeah, look at that. How can I serve food with those fucking things there? The contestants push this idea that the guys are somehow better just because they're men. I mean, seriously, saying that men can cook steaks better than women, that's just ridiculous. Just to a team of girls. The only thing I'm gonna lose to a woman is like an ironing contest. We got this, Bobby. And the worst part is, these sexist attitudes have real world consequences and her carrying the ice and the wine to the kitchen well she's like a perfect example why I can't stand working with women she's pathetic they can seriously affect how well employees perform how they feel like they fit in at work and even their mental health it's no wonder that job satisfaction takes a hit when you're constantly dealing with that kind of nonsense. A lot has been said about the men, but did you know that some of the female contestants on the show were equally awfully sexist? Suzanne from season six thought that women are naturally submissive and men assertive. Listen to her words. I am quoting them verbatim from an interview. Girls are catty bitches and that's never gonna change. I don't know if it's the need to be liked and accepted all the time, especially by a male figure, but the bottom line is, girls don't generally work well together. I definitely think I would have fared better had it been co-ed. There's just vibes that you can jive with and you feel comfortable with. It seems to be that male figures in the kitchen tend to relax other females. If the playing field had been evened out a little, some girls would have naturally floated into that subservient role, while others would rise to the expectation level of being dominant. So what you're saying is, this guy is your philosophical touchstone. What they're doing. What do you expect without a man over there to lead them, of course? Big yikes. So let's bring back the traditional gender roles the world has fought hard to let go of, right? Women should stay at home and men go to war? Then Hell's Kitchen would be all female. And let's not forget about her. Work better with fucking boys. Robin is fired up about the future. I'm f***ing on the blue team where I want to be on the blue team. At least the boys don't f***ing walk in with their periods and don't have catty sh when they walk into the kitchen. I feel like we brush past the fact that so many women in the competition had internalized misogyny of their own. Like, take this for example. 
Bottom line, it shouldn't be about who's better based on gender. It should be about who's the best team overall. That's why I love the black jacket part of the show. It's like a breath of fresh air because it's not about men versus women anymore. It's all about the individual, and that's how it should be. If they're not going to do it draft style like Next Level Chef, another Ramsey show I've gotten super into lately, let me know if you want to hear me talk about it in the future because wow is it good. How about we bring back the OGs and call it the heroes versus villains? For example, bring back Elsie, Julia, Sterling, and Hassan for the heroes team. For villains, I'd have Russell, Sabrina, Elise, and Joseph. Who else would you add? Feel free to cast your own fantasy team in the comments. I'll 100% be down there too. Now, on to number four. The working environment in Hell's Kitchen is extremely toxic. Shocker, right? But it's not just about the physical toll it takes, although that's bad enough. The stress of it all is unbearable. I mean, imagine sleepless nights getting screamed at for the smallest of slip-ups, and having every move you make watched by cameras and microphones. They locked me in a hotel room for three or four days before production started, said Jen Yamola, who finished third in the third season of Hell's Kitchen, a cooking competition. They took all my books, my CDs, my phone, any newspapers. I was allowed to leave the room only with an escort. It was like I was in prison. Thanks for bearing with me through that Hell's Kitchen, a cooking competition bit. Gotta love direct quotes. Anyway, it's no wonder these chefs turn to cigarettes and booze just to cope with it all. In season two, one producer noticed something alarming. At the start, there were only four smokers among the contestants. But by the season's end, that number had ballooned to ten. Yeah, you heard that right. This gig is so stress-inducing that it turns six non-smokers into chain smokers just to cope with the pressure. Season 21 contestants Alejandro Najjar and Cheyenne Nichols spilled the beans about life on the set, revealing that their days usually stretched out to a grueling 16 to 20 hours, depending on Ramsey's agenda and how long their evening confessionals ran. Here's a sneak peek in what their jam-packed days looked like. 6 a.m., rise and shine, slap on those microphones and endure not one but two COVID tests, followed by those oh-so-lovely morning confessions. 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., dive headfirst into a food challenge and then deal with whatever reward or punishment comes their way. 4.30 to 9 p.m., roll up their sleeves for the dreaded dinner service. 9 to 10.30 p.m., face the nerve-wracking eliminations. 10.30 p.m. to 1 a.m., dinner and evening confessionals. Besides sleep, decent food was also hard to come by. Alejandro and Cheyenne remember living off a diet consisting mainly of Red Bull, Hot Pockets, Uncrustables, and other quick-fix meals. Sure, there was a notebook where they could jot down ingredients for a proper meal within limits, but finding the time to actually eat was a luxury. As per Alejandro, Sometimes, they'd band together in the evenings to cook up a hot meal for everyone, but that wasn't a given either. According to Anton Testino, taping Hell's Kitchen can be compared to the Hunger Games, or jail. Meanwhile, Dana Cohen said, you get so used to not being in control of anything. You never have a wallet, you never have your phone, you're wearing a microphone 24 hours a day. You fall asleep and then someone goes up your shirt to change your batteries. Man, that's creepy. And violating. Which brings me to my next point. Number five, there is zero privacy in HK. When you decide to hop on a reality show like Hell's Kitchen, you're basically saying goodbye to any notion of privacy. Sure, you might hope for a little break to catch some Z's or take care of business in peace, but forget about it. Those cameras and microphones are everywhere, even in the bathroom. Yeah, you heard that right. Contestants on the show have revealed that they have to wear their mics all the time even when they're hitting the hay. And those lights, they're on 24-7. So if you're hoping for a midnight snooze, tough luck. If anyone else is up, those lights stay on, capturing every moment for the cameras. Privacy? What's that? Dana Cohen revealed a smart way out of this. She said, the cameras are always on you, the entire time, even in the bathroom. If you know you're going to have a mental breakdown and start crying, what you can do, though, you have to sing. If you sing a song while you're crying, they can't put that on TV. A copyrighted song. That's how you break the matrix, even with their substantial budget. The cost of music rights is huge, and networks like Fox are cautious about overspending on licensing fees. For example, a Drake or Beyonce song. 
Somebody's got to get paid. Plus, these chefs have their own secret language, using code words to chat without tipping off the producers and crew. It's strategic, but it's also dystopian, right? Imagine the lengths they had to go to just because they didn't want the entire world to see and judge them at their most vulnerable states. And now, time for number six. You cannot be a customer in the HK restaurant where it's recorded. Don't get confused. You can visit Ramsey's HK restaurants, but not the set. Obviously, you knew the difference, right? According to a TV guide writer, Hell's Kitchen is built on a soundstage, and everything appears even more exaggerated than on TV, and the lighting is far brighter than you'd expect in a fine dining restaurant. Now, when you're watching the show, you can't help but imagine how cool it would be to be there in person, right? I mean, you get to enjoy an amazing meal while witnessing Gordon Ramsay unleash his fiery temper on those poor chefs. Some of you may even want to go up to the past to fulfill your fantasies of getting called a donkey or worse. But unless you've got some serious connections over at Fox, chances are you won't be scoring a seat at the Hell's Kitchen restaurant where all the taping happens. If you do, though, hit me up. In a Reddit Ask Me Anything session with ex-contestant Kevin Cottle, he spilled the beans that the main folks who get to chow down at Hell's Kitchen are basically the friends and family of the crew. Sure, they might roll out the red carpet for some special guests now and then, usually a handful of C-list celebs you might catch on camera sipping wine. But speaking of which, seriously, how do the Hell's Kitchen contestants know every single C-tier celebrity and immediately proclaim they have been a fan since childhood? It has to be fake something they're prompted to say. I mean, you seriously don't expect them to watch CW shows and know who a Misha Collins is, right? Anyway, like I was saying, unless you got some serious connections, and again, hit me up if you do, getting a seat at the table is about as likely as winning the lottery. Now, number seven. Oh, number seven. Believe me, you're not ready for this. The production team sets you up to fail. If you're a fan of the show, you've probably found yourself yelling at the TV screen in disbelief more times than you can count. I know I have. It's just mind-boggling how the chefs can't seem to nail down some of the show's staple dishes. I mean, come on, they make risotto, beef wellington, and scallops every single season. Yet somehow, they still manage to mess them up. And even though some chefs are more skilled than others, it's still shocking to see how often these basic dishes end up butchered in the kitchen, even by the most talented folks. Craig from season 4 said, Things like mixing bowls would disappear when you needed them. We would also prep other cooks stations, which you don't normally do as a cook, so if they prep it wrong, you pay the price. Plus, there are so many sneaky edits and so many more manipulations. For example, that scene in the finale of season 15 where Danny abandons Ariel, turns out Where is Danny? It never happened. Danny tweeted, trying not to be furious at Hell's Kitchen editing, I left while cleaning, after we were completely done with service, and Ariel confirmed that Danny never deserted her. She replied, girl, I couldn't find you to add you to my tweet. Thank you. And you are still there for me. Only we understand HK. And you know what? I believe them. Now look closely at this scene. Back. You go, Dan. Come lose my shit. Come on, Danny. I know you're strong. Get me those pork chops as soon as you can, Danny. The voiceover, it clearly sounds like Ariel's voice has been added to that clip where she's not facing the camera. Plus, one second, Jared is acting shocked and within the next split second appears to be carrying a box containing utensils. This is pretty unusual during dinner services, as such boxes are typically used for transporting dishes either for washing or for storage in the kitchen after service. It's possible that they cut that bit in from after they'd already wrapped. Many of the other contestants have come out and disclosed that the production team sabotages their chances of performing decently. You absolutely cannot miss out on this video I made to know all the juicy details. Gordon Ramsay admitted that Hell's Kitchen is fake. Uh, so that's it for today, folks. Which point shocked you the most? Go ahead and drop your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you enjoy my videos, don't forget to check out my social media pages. And of course, support my channel by leaving a like, subscribing, and turning on my post notifications too. Also, make sure to check out this next video right here. It's even better.